So why garden with succulents? They are low water use, which is super important nowadays. Um, dense planting eliminates weeds, so it eliminates the, the, the need for weeding, which is a big pain, uh, especially now that the rains are coming up. Um, and I think for me, the very best reason to, um, to, to garden with succulents is because they're very colorful and interesting, even without flowers. Um, it's fun and rewarding um, to, to garden with succulents and um, it also can reduce fire risk. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different succulents that are my favorites. Then I'll talk about, um, I think design principles first and then soil preparation and then uh, a little summary. And like I said before, feel free to ask questions. Okay, so um, succulents and cactus for your garden. The majority of what I'll be talking about are aloes, aeoniums, echeverias. Aloes are from Africa primarily. Aeoniums are from um, like the Canary Island area. Echeverias are from primarily Mexico. Crashula, I'm not sure where they're from. Agave, of course, the Southwest. Dudlia is the one genus that is um, native to California. It's almost exclusively all Dudleyas are from California. So I'm gonna talk about aloes first, and um, you probably know this, but aloes range in size from uh, tiny little ground covers to uh, trees, big trees. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the little ones first. Um, this is aloe nobilis. Come over here. It's fixed. <laughs> okay. Aloe nobilis is uh, very, it's very small uh, aloe. It's only about three or four inches high. And then it sends up the bloom spikes that are about another foot. Oops. All right. Um, most of these bloom in spring, but some do bloom in the summertime and in the fall. They're starting now. Um, aloe arborescence should be pretty soon. Aloe, uh, let's see which one, aloe, um, Cynthia Giddy is blooming right now. So um, I'll uh, kind of try to let you know which ones bloom when, because it's really fun to have them blooming all the time if you can. So aloe blue elf is a really great little aloe. It's very dense um, and it's blue, like you can see in the photo. And these uh, flower spikes last a really long time. Usually um, in May and June, you'll see the flower spikes. You, uh, this is a very effective plant planted in large drifts. Um, I've seen, seen it landscaped uh, in, in uh, commercial areas using this plant. It looks really great. And it's so dense, there's no way weeds get in, in there, which is a big bonus for me. Aloe striata, you've probably seen this one. Unlike many aloes, it doesn't offset, is a singular aloe. And it sends up a branched uh, inflorescence in springtime that lasts fairly long, a month or two. Um, this is a hedgehog aloe. Um, I have no idea how to say that in, I guess it's Dutch, <laughs> um, but it's a very pretty aloe. Um, the, the growing habit is, is nice. It's just a little bit bigger than the other ones I showed. Uh, the flowers are larger in relation to the, to the foliage. So it is uh, effect, uh, very pretty aloe. Aloe vera uh, quick Sure. From uh, Susan, can you mention which are good in the pot rather than in the ground? Oh, okay. Um, really, all aloes are great in pots. Um, that blue elf would be super effective. It would fill a pot. It would be a, a really pretty thing to have. Um, you can mix the aloes as well in pots. Um, they do great in pots. I mean, I have not tried an aloe that hasn't done well. Uh, this aloe variegata is, um, is got just a, the foliage. I think the foliage is probably prettier than the aloe. Um, it's just, you know, this um, brown speckled and it combines well with other plants. So it's a really great little plant. Aloe Cynthia Giddy, I've mentioned this one before. This is a, a hybrid 
what is going on? It's going advanced by itself. All right. Okay. Well, I'll just, <laughs> I hope it doesn't keep happening. Okay. So Allocynthia Giddy is a hybrid and it was um, uh, bred by, I think it was Cynthia Giddy or named after her. I'm not really sure. Um, but it blooms more than once. A lot of the aloes bloom only one time, even though it is a month or two, it is a long time between blooms, but this one blooms uh, repetitively throughout the year. So it's a really good one to have. And the foliage has got a, a, a modeling to it that's uh, very attractive. Aloe Safari Rose, uh, there it's called the Safari, Safari Series. There's a bunch of different um, plants. This one is the Safari Rose. There's a uh, Safari, I don't know, Sunset is another one, Safari Orange. And they're all um, bred to bloom repetitively and um, and ha have on a nice looking uh, compact plant. Uh, this one is well known in the trade uh, alloy. Aloe uh, redhead, um, it, uh, it's, it's compact and short and it blooms, it sends up bloom spikes all, all year around. Um, aloe chabadii is from Saudi Arabia, actually. It's a low growing aloe with a branched inflorescence that blooms um, no, nearer to summertime. You don't see this one a lot, but it's a, it's a really nice aloe. It's a solitary aloe, so it doesn't offset. Um, I don't know who that is. Um, oh, there it goes. That was me. I was reminding myself of my talk, <laughs> and here I am. Oh, okay. All right. So um, aloe camperi. This one does offset. This is a larger aloe. It it can be about uh, three feet tall without the inflorescences. And then the inflorescences come up after that. Um, it blooms in early summer. Um, it blooms really heavily. It's a really, really attractive aloe. It just, uh, it only blooms the one time though. So keep that in mind. Aloe Cameronia, if I were to tell you to get one aloe, um, this, this would be high on my list. This one is a larger aloe as well uh, with, you know, when it starts to increase the foliage height can be about three feet, two and a half to three feet tall. And then the inflorescences up from there. Um, I love this aloe because it repeats bloom. It, it makes a very nice um, habit. And then the, the flowers are this really uh, rosy red orange color that's, I think, really pleasing. And then in the summertime, the foliage itself turns orange. And uh, with <clears throat> if the conditions, if it's in full sun, if it's got a little bit less water, it will be really brilliant orange. And I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, but it's cool. So, yeah, I recommend this one. Aloe vera, and I'm, everybody's heard of that. Um, it's a great plant. I've noticed lately that they're using it a lot in commercial installations. It looks great um, planted in mass. The, the foliage has a, a blue ghostly kind of green color that is really unique and, and lovely. Um, and then it sends up the, the yellow bloom spikes. It blooms for quite a long time and it's in, in uh, early summer. Aloe arborescence, you've seen this, you know, it's all along the freeways here in San Diego. Um, it can get by on, on no additional water. Um, aloe arborescence means tree aloe and it can, it sort of like uh, increases vertically and also horizontally. And I just love that aloe flower, that, that orange red color is just, um, so pleasing to me, but you have to be careful where you place it because it does get uh, really big. Aloe Scarlet Rockets, this is a relatively new uh, hybrid and um, it is really this sort of red color and um, it gets about, um, the foliage itself is about uh, two and a half to three feet and then the bloom spikes are much larger. Um, it can be uh, like a, about four, five feet, about five feet tall. 
blooms for a long period of time in early spring. Um, actually, it'll be, I think it'll be like um, more like January or something like that, that oh, this one blooms. Okay. Aloe Eric the Red is another hybrid that's fairly recent and it's very much like the one I just showed, but it, it's more of an orange red and it's um, more upright than the other. And I just love this red and it blooms for a very, very long period of time. It's this red color even in bud. So it it's, um, shows this red for a long time. Aloe Tangerine, um, this is a, another relatively new hybrid that I really, really like. And I'm not sure the what they used uh, for the species that they for the cross, but um, it's a big bulky plant with really large uh, flowers, and it's just really pretty if you have some space. Um, this one gets pretty big. Aloe ferox. Now we're getting into more of the tree aloes. Aloe ferox um, is is big. It um, you know, it's, it's over, it can be around like 10 feet tall. So the ones going forward now are the bigger aloes. They're going to be uh, 10 feet or so. Um, um, and look, and aloe ferox, be careful when you buy it because the color of the flower varies so much and it can be a really muddy sort of brown color. And um, unless that's what you want, um, I, I prefer the, the brighter orange hues. Uh, aloe Marlothii is from Africa. It's uh, the mountain aloe. It has a branched inflorescence that's um, horizontal and it does vary in color. This is mine, it, um, it's sort of a goldish color. And then real tree aloes, aloe dendron. The, a lot of the tree aloes now are called aloe dendron. This one's Tonganensis, and uh, it's like you see, I, I have this plant. It's not particularly fast growing, so mine's not, it's about half that big. It hasn't bloomed yet, but um, I'm really looking forward to the blooms. The one I have, the cultivar is called Medusa, and um, it was bred for many um, flower spikes, so I look forward to that. My hummingbirds are, have been asking about it, and they look forward to it. Two. Um, aloe is this another cross, um, aloe Hercules. And then at the base, there is another great uh, landscape aloe, aloe rubra violacea. Uh, it blooms, um, it's another one from like Saudi Arabia area, and it blooms uh, nearer to summertime. Um, I have an aloe Hercules at home, and it is, it shot up to I don't know, 18 feet in like five years. So it gets really tall. It has, it doesn't bloom reliably. In fact, mine hasn't bloomed yet. And I've had it for, I don't know, 13 years. But um, it is a, a focal point in the landscape and it's uh, really attractive. Um, yeah, and that's why I, I garden with aloes because I absolutely love hummingbirds. So uh, if, you know, if that's a, good reason for you. That's, that's great. I, I prefer not to use bird feeders. I prefer to use plants to feed my, my um, hummingbirds. And okay, so aeoniums, um, they're, they're funny. Um, they look fantastic. Um, once the rains come, they're going to look really good. They open up and some are better at opening up than others. Um, some of them, uh, particularly the Aeonium Schwarzkopf, which I'm going to talk about in a second, in the uh, summertime, they have a habit and I, and I get calls, you know, as a master gardener and what's wrong with my Aeoniums because the, uh, the flower um, or, you know, the rosette of leaves closes up like this. And people don't know what's wrong. And what's wrong is just the natural habit of the plant. When it's uh, hot and dry, it um, closes up to protect itself and conserve water. But some, some of the aeoniums are better at not doing that, particularly if you keep them watered. And this is one of them. Whoops, the aeonium mint saucer. I love this plant. Um, it's such a real pretty refreshing green. The, the rosettes, you know, they're 
huge. They get to be um, at least two feet across and there's little ones and bigger ones, but um, it just mixes really well with other plants and no weeds can grow. Aeonium, Aeonium sunburst. Now I have no problem with this plant. It does so well for me. I just cut off one of the heads. If I want a new plant, I just cut it off and stick it in the, in the ground and it, um, it, reproduces and grows a new shrub. It's like a shrub, this plant, it's sort of like a shrub. And uh, the, it, it holds its color. It's colorful like this all year around, which is uh, really great if you like a um, colorful, unchanging garden. Uh, Anum Schwarzkopf, I was just talking about that. It means blackhead. And uh, these rosettes, uh, like I said, in the heat of the summertime will close up. And so that's something to be aware of when you use this plant. Okay. Uh, Aeon Aeonium Jack Caitlin. This is an Aeonium that I really, really like. It's a form that's kind of a, a low shrub. It's a low dome and it gets, uh, it increases in size. Um, the one I have now is about um, two and a half feet by two feet high. And it's just this dense mound of colorful heads and it combines well with other plants and it's just a, a lovely thing and it chokes out all the weeds. Okay. Aeonium kiwi is very similar. Um, uh, the, it's got this uh, tricolor uh, color, coloration and um, it's uh, really pretty and it combines well with other plants and I'm, going to talk about plant combinations. Uh, cotyledon is not a aeonium, it's cotyledon, mint truffles. Um, this has uh, got a similar habit. It's just increases in size and offsets and makes a shrub-like plant. And I, I, it's just a, it's just once again, a really good combiner. You can't have, I mean, you could, you could have all colorful succulents and that'd be great. But if you want a little green, um, throw in some plants like this to uh, calm the eye. Uh, cotyledon orbiculata, this one, hummingbirds love this plant. Um, it's super easy. These are all easy plants. You just plant them and basically forget about them, uh, water them, I don't know, once a month. Um, and then here's some of the Echeverias, Echeveria pearl von Nuremberg. The colors on this get more intense when um, conditions are less favorable, when it's drier, when it's hotter. The pinks really come out and the blues come out and it's a very pretty plant. And it looks like, uh, I don't know, um, what's that called? Pearl, pearl, pearl essence, I guess. Uh, Echeveria elegans, this is a great, it just offsets and makes a really nice, um, bunch of these blue goblet um, shaped rosettes. Uh, Echeveria andromeda. This is a larger Echeveria. It's uh, about uh, a foot high and a foot wide, but it has all these colors in it, the reds and orange, the blue, the pink, it's, it's all in there. So it's a great combining plant in design. You could pick up the blue, you could pick up the red with other plants. You could put in a a red uh, lantana or a blue senecio, and it would look very attractive. Echeveria black prints. Um, a lot of these uh, succulents have black versions, and uh, this one really is black and um, cool, you know, blue and black. I mean, it's just really cool looking. Uh, Echeveria blue atoll. Um, just a really pretty blue color. And yeah, they also flower as well. So they send up spikes of uh, coral colored flowers that the hummingbirds really like. Echeveria afterglow with the wavy edge. It's just a very attractive plant. There's just so many of them and they're so pretty and they're, you know, they've um, bred all these different forms and colors and, um, you know, what's not to like. Uh, Crashula erosula. It's sometimes called campfire aloe. It uh, makes, it's in this red, this intense. Um, and I'm trying to remember if that in the winter, I actually believe it's in the winter time where this plant gets the really intense coloration. 
Um, it can range from green to uh, yellow to this really intense red. You can use this uh, as a large scale ground cover if you, you, know, you really like this coloration. Um, Crashula Hummel Sunset. Crashula is the same family as jade plant. Um, this is a, basically a tricolor jade and it um, stays pretty small. It's a, just a really pretty color combination. Graptopetalum is um, a succulent from I believe South America. And it's got this pink blue thing going on. It looks great hanging out of a pot. And all of these, I mean, you can make fabulous combinations in pots. Uh, pick, a, pick a succulent that's more upright as the focal point. Pick something that is uh, denser and bushier for the middle section. And then pick something like this graptopedalum that will cascade down from the edge of the pot. And you'll have a really nice looking pot. Okay, Graptocetum is a inter, uh, intergeneric cross between uh, Graptopetalum and Sedum. And this one's called bronze. There's one called California sunset that's just really pretty. You know, it looks like a California sunset. And these tend to be uh, also, um, they spread and they also hang really well out of a pot. Sedum coppertone, this is a fantastic plant. I love this plant. It looks so good with blue. I mean, when you think on the color wheel, um, you want, I mean, if you want uh, complementary colors because they are so satisfying to see them together, this combines well with Senecio, which is a bluer color or any of the other blue um, succulents that I've talked about. Um, really great combination. I'll, I'll talk more about, I'll show you some more uh, about this one a little later. Yeah, and, and talking about Senecios, there's a bunch of different Senecios. They mostly have in common is this, um, just such a pretty sea blue color. They come in dense. Um, they, uh, I use them a lot as a, uh, in, the, in the front of a bed as a ground cover and as a um, still place for your eye to rest. Uh, this one's Senecio mandrelisque. There's uh, Senecio serpens that's got a smaller leaf to it. Um, I, li I like this plant. It's slower growing, uh, but you know it it will eventually be dense and low growing. Um, this tends to be everybody's favorite plant, uh, Calanchoe lucie or flapjacks. Um, the colors intensify, I believe it's in the winter time. Um, and it offsets, uh, but also sends up bloom spikes, apparent, uh, sometimes though it, with uh, white flowers. Um, and I didn't talk about this, but this plant and um, the agaves have a similarity in that when they send up a bloom spike, that portion of the plant will die back. That's sort of the final, um, final thing that the, that portion of the plant does. It gets enough resources that it, it feels comfortable sending up a bloom spike and then it blooms and then that portion dies, but it's okay uh, because the plant will offset and um, carry on. Uh, I love Kalanchoe's. Um, this one's called Bracte uh, Bracteata, but uh, the common name I think is Silver Spoons. It functions like a shrub in the landscape. It grows dense. And uh, like a you know rounded like a shrub, you can cut it if if you don't like the way it's shaped. If you want it slightly different, it's cool. Um, it's just a uh, just this um, beautiful white foliage, and then it sends up the flower spikes that the hummingbirds really like. So, I I mean I could do a whole slideshow on just calanchoes, but uh, here's just a couple. There's Calan I mean there's so many calanchoes. I I don't believe I put many in here. Yeah, I didn't, but you know, look it up. Kalanchoes are cool. There's one called Baharensis that's uh, furry and uh, tree-like. And um, anyway, here's a couple, I mean, and you could go on for days about agaves, how, how great they are. Here, this has got the uh, the Echeveria elegans as a skirt. You can see that down here and see how it's a pleasing combination. Behind it is an aloe. That will be a focal point when it blooms. Um, this will, this is a great thing because 
the Echeveria elegance chokes out weeds. The um, the agave blue flame has got that that text that wild texture that looks like flames, and then behind that is the the aloe that blooms, and uh, you just got a really nice little composition here with hardly any maintenance at all. Like I can't even think of anything except maybe cutting off a flower spike once in a while. All right. Uh, agave attenuata ray of light, you know, it's a variegated plant. Um, use this as a focal point. Um, uh, agave ovatifolia, I love this plant. This is from central Mexico. <clears throat> there are several forms of this one, but um, this ovatifolia, you know, is I, I'm not sure there's a common name, is it might be hedgehog cactus, but they are low and wide. And so it's very pleasing and very easy to use in, in a in a landscape design. Um, yeah, it does have spikes. Oh, this is a hedgehog cactus. Yeah. Oh, so agave perii, they uh, there's a bunch of different forms of it, but this one is uh truncata, so it's lower and shorter than the other ones. And uh, it's a great plant. Oh, I didn't show you this. Um, this is also an agave that's right next to it with uh, the spiky foliage. It's every single one of those has a hypodermic needle at the end. So you want to cite that one really carefully. I'm um, trying to remember the species name, but I can't right off the bat there. Okay. And then this is a really common cactus in uh, landscapes, particularly commercial landscapes. <clears throat> Echinocactus grusonii. Um, I, I believe I've read that this no longer exists in the wild, but it does exist in uh, people's gardens. It's just a barrel cactus. It's beautiful. It increases in size. You want to plant it in multiples. It looks great in, in um, in threes uh, and plant them, you know, a little bit apart. So when they do increase in size, uh, they will meld together. And then it has uh, yellow flowers, um, just a really pleasing plant and beautiful in, uh, in combination with other plants. Uh, Hespero yucca. Now this is a native plant and I love this plant and I really don't know why it's not used in landscapes more often. Um, it's such a um, steady, hard worker. It just doesn't, it doesn't change much. And um, it's just so amenable to a uh, combination with other plants. Uh, one of my absolute favorite plants, it's very much like that um, agave I showed you. It can, it combines well with other plants and um, increases in size. And then it sends up a bloom spike in the uh, spring. I think it's the spring, late spring. Um, that uh, is popular with, uh, well, there's a particular moth that pollinates it. But uh, then, and then I want to mention if you are uh, wildlife fans, native wildlife fans, after the bloom spike of this is finished, you know what? I might be mixed. I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. <laughs> okay. So Hespro Yucca Whippei uh, is our native plant and it's super cool. Um, yes, it has teeth along the edge of every single one of those. I think that kind of goes without saying that a lot of these plants are armed. So just uh, FYI. Um, love, love, love this plant. It's from uh, Mexico, Texas. Um, Hespero aloe parviflora. It doesn't grow really fast. So in order for it to increase in size to this really nice, chunky, a uh, plant with lots of bloom spikes, it takes a few years. So just know that and be patient. It needs full sun, full, full, full sun. And um, you can, you know, uh, water it uh, in the summertime, unlike a lot of the natives, this one, uh, because it's from, if you if you have plants from Texas, just know that they, they like and would like to have a little bit of summer water. Um, and, and it goes without saying probably, but these blooms are super popular with the, the hummingbirds. And I love, love, love this plant. It is not armed. So keep that in mind if you're uh, gardening uh, with grandchildren or around areas where you don't want uh, spikes. And here are some of, na of the native 
succulents uh, are dudleyas are just just lovely um Britonii, and then I'm going to talk about some other ones, but they have a uh, powder coating on the leaves, which makes it appear white, and that protects them from the intensity of the sun. Um, Dudleya edulis. Um, this one looks cool, uh, draping out of pots. Um, <laughs> I think it has a name like Dead Man's Fingers or something like that, which is hilarious. Um, Dudleya pulverolenta. I'm, I'm sorry if I, I don't remember. Uh, I usually either know the common name or I know the scientific name and I don't usually know both, but uh, chalk leaf, I believe it might be chalk leaf, Dudley, uh, um, just a beautiful, beautiful plant. And then it sends up uh, bloom spikes that the hummingbirds really like. Um, okay, so uh, here I'll talk about uh, design principles. So I'm just gonna touch on this and using these principles in garden design will help your garden look more pleasing to the eye. So um, repetition helps create rhythm in the garden uh, when you have a plant that you you use um, in a few different areas. It keeps your eye moving around. It gives your garden cohesion and uh, it's uh, satisfying to, to have grounding elements that create rhythm in the garden. Uh, unity and proportion. Um, what can I say about that? Um, I mean, subconsciously, your, your brain is always looking for unity and proportion, and you can achieve that by repetition, by um, uh, re repeating proportions of plants, re re repeating textures of plants, and that brings unity in the garden. Okay, um, yeah, for unity, it could be color, it could be texture, proportion, uh, different elements, uh, different forms. So I'll, I'll give you some examples later on. Um, and then, you know, combined textures, that is just, that is just such a great thing to do. Uh, you have a, you know, a spiky plant, a globular plant. Um, a grassy plant, um, something that's covered in flowers. Combining those is is just really pleasing to the eye. <clears throat> and have a have a color palette if you want. Um, you might uh, ignore that in in favor of repetition. You know, uh, you can do that, or you could just really pay a lot of attention to a, a color palette and adhere to that and then ignore maybe textures or something like, you know, it's, it's, it's all up to you. You can decide be in beforehand or while you're even doing it, what's most important to you. Um, and then, you know, have a focal point that one, that one's really important. Um, you can uh, um, choose to uh, have repetition or not, or, combine textures or not, but you always need a focal point. And that can be um, an extra large plant. It could be rocks, big rocks. It could be pots. It could be potted plants, but always have a focal point. Um, let's see. Oh, it's always nice to have brightly colored ceramic pots somewhere in your garden. Um, it just uh, is a just a fun thing to do and it just um, really completes the look. So I'll, I'll talk to you more about this and I'll give you some examples. And please feel free to ask questions. Um, repetition, here um, you can see uh, agave um, blue glow, which is here in the front. This is a great agave that I didn't talk about earlier, but I'll talk about now. And you can see also that um, barrel cactus is uh, used here, but there is a repetition of plants in this garden <clears throat> and it, uh, it leads the eye through the garden and it's uh, very um, well used here. Yeah, here's a repetition again, you know, repetition of rocks, repetition of the barrel cactus. You could see this garden continuing with a few more rocks, a few more barrel cactus, some different plants, but <clears throat> The repetition really makes this this garden. 
I'm sorry, I need to drink some water. Here um, is repetition of texture. This is that, um, I don't know what you call it, leafy texture of that Hespero yucca here, the blue, and then all, uh, also here with the agave, and then further back with, uh, I'm not sure what that is. I think it might be a yucca. <clears throat> but you know, repetition of textures helps uh, give this garden cohesion. Um, unity. Um, You know, I think it's the coral color that unifies this composition. There is a sculpture there of a um, <clears throat> saguaro, and uh, the the uh, the coral color of the aloes. I might that might be, oh yeah, that might be aloes triata up there on the upper left, and then there's coral color of uh, euphorbia, and then a different aloe with. Um, with the coral. And then so the coral color unifies this whole comp composition. <clears throat> Unity here is uh, achieved with the senecio that runs through this garden and it leads, the path also leads the eye to the house. And that is the focal point of the composition. Um, oh, I just threw this one in here. I just found this lately. Um, I just, just love this. I mean, you know, who needs flowers when you have have this uh, uh, different um, different of these succulents will be more intensely colored at different times of the year, but primarily it will be like this most of the time. Um, that uh, dark aloe might you know ball up in the summertime, but um, just just pretty. You know, it's pretty, and you don't have to do anything. There's no not a lot of uh, maintenance here, you know, run the hose on that, you know, once a month. Um, if something gets too big and it is taking too much room, you can trim it. Um, you can use the trimmings to start other um, succulents in other areas. Oh, and here's that, uh, that um, succulent, that campfire succulent I was talking about here in the front um, on the left. Here's another one I just threw in, but I, I like this. They've combined the grasses with the succulents and then they've skirted it all with the senecio. Um, This is that, uh, that um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, and then you've got the, uh, the unifying theme of the, the complementary colors working here. It's always satisfying and uh, there's repetition and there's repetition of textures and it's just a, uh, Nice little vignette. And here, uh, the golds of the, this is a leucospermum, leucospermum, leucodendron, sorry, leucodendron here um, with the, the bright yellow uh, sort of flower looking things, not really flowers, but in the winter time, these become bright yellow. And then this agave here, the, the variegation is just so pretty. And then the two textures together with the aloe behind, as a focal point is just such a nice, easy comp composition. And then you skirt that with Senecio or any other ground cover aloe and you've got easy care, easy maintenance, interesting and satisfying um, uh, composition in the garden. And then texture, combination of textures, you've got that the aloe that I love so much, the uh, blue flame here in the front that it looks like flames. It looks like dancing flames and it's just so uh, tremendous. Um, uh, you've got palm fronds, you've got the uh, sagos, the uh, tree aloe there and um, just a nice uh, juxtaposition of textures. You could, along the bottom of these, you could have uh, different textures of uh, ground cover aloes as well. Um, and how fun is that? Uh, and rocks, man, put some rocks in. Look at the front of that. There's these rocks and they look so great. Uh, a couple of boulders, you know, throw in a couple of boulders. I mean, how beautiful that is. And there's a pot there. Oh, this is the uh, Kalanchoe Bajarensis in that pot. It gets considerably bigger than this and it looks very architectural. Uh, great focal point in a pot. Um, this one's small yet, but um, it will get bigger and uh, you could change the pot accordingly. 
And then the tree aloe there is so pretty. And this is aloe marlothii that's blooming here. And that's a great focal point. Oh. Yeah. So pots and rocks and cactus, they all look so great together. Um, texture. Yeah, look at all the textures here. Look at how fun that is. Uh, Hespero yucca again, aloe. Uh, there's a opuntia. I didn't talk about those colors. And um, you've got... Um, complementary colors, the blue and the orange always works. Okay, and and then against a fence, I mean, how cool is that? The, this brown fence, I mean, the, it uh, echoes the brown of this um, Echeveria right here in front that's kind of got the brown. And then this is uh, this is something you could do or not. You can You can skirt the front with rock like this, or you could use, um, you know, Senecio or uh, Sedum, either way, you know, you could put um, black uh, Mexican beach pebbles in the front. And that's so pretty. Uh, there's just so many things you can do. You can see a piece of drift, driftwood here and, and how pleasing that is. And then some boulders. I mean, it's just, you almost can't do it wrong, but because it seems to have so many great design features built in already, like the color coloration and um, textures. So uh, color palette. Um, yeah, so here, they, you know, they they use this uh, beautiful rust color with uh, the Senecio in front and uh, the two complementary colors can be uh, repeated in the garden, but I, I just love orange and blue. They just make me so happy. <laughs> Um, and then uh, this is a, uh, the tree here is a great tree to use uh, Palo Verde. It's a three, three um, part cross and it's Palo Verde Desert Museum. Um, it doesn't do very well at the coast, but if you are inland some, you know, this is a good, a good plant. Um, oh, look at this. Look at how pretty this is. So pretty. Uh, this uh, red blooming uh, thing here in front next to the pot, uh, Russell, Russelliana equisetifolia. I mean, it blooms all the time and it doesn't grow super fast. It, it takes a while to increase. It does like a little water. Uh, unlike a lot of these plants, it could use a little water, but, uh, look at, you know, the, the reds and the, I mean, it's, uh, just a monochromatic type color scheme with the burgundy and the red and the rust and and then there's these euphorbias here um, with uh, in the in the front um i'm th trying to think of the name i can't but okay so uh yeah rocks and pots and plants and cast iron i mean it's just so pretty um and i like this so much um you know, say you have a garden space and there's a very steep hillside behind it, put in something like this. Um, there's space for plants. It's basically, you know, a big pot here, a planter with, um, this is a Senecio, Senecio falcata that they've used as a spiller. So they uh, they have the spiller that, and then they have all the plants in the middle. They call those the fillers. And then they have a uh, Dracaena draco as a focal point. And then you've got <clears throat> the colorful aloes, you've got the throw pillows. Um, it's just, and then the Mexican beach pebbles, don't those look dynamite in the, the seams there. I, and then the, the uh, little fire um, uh, pit. I mean, great, just a great composition. Um, yeah, this is great too. You know, pick your paint, pick your stucco paint colors accordingly, you know, pick, uh, Look at your succulents and, um, you know, get you, get out your paint swatches and uh, you can um, really make a beautiful garden. And here, again, are some big bowls that are uplit, uplit with the, uh, the lighting and uh, how cool is that? And I'm sure at nighttime, the shadows of the, you know, the, the wavy succulents uh, are cast against the, the wall there. Focal point, yeah. So what would be the focal point? I guess the door, right? Um, yeah, this is a friend of mine's garden in Poway, designed by Linda Bresler, who's 
who's unfortunately moved away. Uh, she was fun. Um, all kinds of plants in there, but uh, you know, you, you see the pops of the coral color created by the Kalanchoe, the aloes and the uh, euphorbia that repeat. And then the focal point of the table and chairs and the, um, the queen palm. I love this. I love this so much. Um, if you have a, you know, a typical suburban house to put in a low wall in front, a low stucco wall, low rock wall, any kind of wall, but it, what a great back, backdrop to um, uh, uh, a succulent garden. And here they've used pea gravel and it looks fantastic with some, you know, colored uh, rocks and succulents. And this is super, I mean, satisfying low maintenance, low water, and just a lot of fun. And this is that Dieter uh, Buckner garden, rocks and pots. Um, rocks are, are great. Uh, I, you know, advise using them. Um, <clears throat> and then he's got that fireplace that's clad in copper and it oxidizes, oxidizes to that beautiful blue color that um, is perfect with succulents. Uh, rocks and pots. Here's a, another pot. Oh, uh, don't mind the pot. <laughs> potties back there. I didn't take the. I could have taken those out with Photoshop, but I, I guess I didn't see them. Uh, um, how funny. Anyway, yeah. So cool though with uh, this agave and uh, this pot with a very similar color. Rocks and pots again. Um, rocks and plants, and this has got the red lantana with the. Uh, the globe um, cactus and the different textures, the different colors and uh, the focal point of that tree. I'm not sure the tree, what the tree is there, but I believe this is in Phoenix, but you can do something similar here, no problem. Uh, okay, so soil, you know, so you say, oh, I have dense, heavy clay. Well, you can, you can work with that. Um, I, I, I've changed a lot of dense, heavy clay into really nice soil just by topping it with a thick layer of tree trimming mulch and waiting for uh, a couple of weeks. Or, you know, it can happen really fast, but uh, usually what happens is you have very, very dense, heavy clay. It's not workable. You can barely dig it. And you would be amazed at how if you put down, say right now, a thick layer of tree trimming mulch, you know, I don't know, uh, I, I put down a, a foot at one point, you can, you know, four inches to a foot. And uh, what it does to the soil underneath it is um, almost, well, I, I think it's miraculous. Um, it makes it soft and diggable. But uh, <clears throat> if you want to just avoid the whole situation, um, succulents are not very deep rooted. Um, neither are cactus. So if you top the soil that you do have with a mix of a third organic with two thirds mineral. So this little chart here, you can use, um, you know, a third of the uh, ingredients on the left with two thirds of the ingredients on the right, and you'll make a very nice soil for succulents that drains well. And um, you just put that down, I don't know, six inches thick, maybe not even that, not, yeah, probably not even that on top of your existing soil. And uh, that'll help with the drainage. You can also plant a little bit high and uh, mulch uh, over any exposed roots. And that will, um, that will help with the drainage. Uh, avoid soils. Question. Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah. With the rocky ground covers, how are weeds discouraged? Is there plastic under the ground you may have answered Wait. this sorry I didn't, I didn't hear that oh um how are we discouraged using these i still didn't i it, it's cutting out i'm just, i don't know why um maybe can you write it or how are weeds discouraged oh. with the rocky materials oh okay this is a good question. Um, they actually aren't, you know, they're not. And, but, you know, um, my goal usually is to cover 
an area with plants. So, um, you know, I may have a little rock in front and, uh, but I want to have dense plantings. I want my ground cover to spread. I want uh, the agaves to get big. And um, so that that's my goal. I mean, it's, it's up to you. You know, if you like the look of rock and you want more rock, just know that you're going to have a few more weeds than I, I would because <laughs> I have a lot of plants. I hope that answers your question. All right. Oh, I wanted to mention um, avoid using any soil mix that has soil mo moist crystals in it or anything like that. They're uh, they hold way too much water and you will have dead plants. Um, oh, this isn't my house. I just put this little area in last year and I'm, you know, I just uh, really like the colors. Okay, so that here's another colorful. So if you have any questions, let me know. I have one question. Okay. Um, where would I, if I wanted to start a succulent garden, where where would you recommend I look to purchase or um, how would I get these succulents? Good From question. friends? You know, you know where I get a lot. Um, yeah, friends. Um, my neighborhood actually has a succulent swap uh, once a year. We just had it. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, you could drive by if somebody's got like a, you know, bunch of Senecio or whatever, ask them if they could have a couple of cuttings. Uh, the, all these plants grow easily from cuttings and it requires no special anything. You just put them in the ground. You just plop them in the ground. They make contact with soil and they root. Um, let's see. I know that I'm going to get off of this call and I'll I'll think of a bunch of other things to say, but I get a lot of succulents because I care about whether or not plants are treated with chemicals because I, I garden for wildlife. So I don't want chemicals, uh, you know, pesticides in my garden. So I get a lot of uh, plants from Etsy because you can ask their hobby growers and you can ask them if they use pesticides. And most of the time they don't, they feel just the same as I do that they don't want them. And so I, to keep my garden pesticide free, I, I buy a lot of plants from Etsy. Walter Anderson's is, is a great source. They're, you know, pricey. Um, what else? There's probably, hmm, um yeah i'm not sure other we have things? a couple of more questions for yeah, you okay sure yeah so um when preparing to plant in a pot do you moisten the soil to start it yeah i what i would do is like i i had that little third organic two-thirds mineral and i would make the whole pot the whole entire pot contain the same soil mixture because you don't want say rocks on the bottom and then the soil mix on the top because it it sounds weird but anytime that there is an interface between two different kinds of soil texture the 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 water will be held in the uh the upper one and it will not drain so you don't want to mix textures in a pot you want the whole pot to be um you know, the organic two thirds mineral. And yes, it should be moistened when you plant your plants because, you know, that mixture automatically drains well. So um, it'll be, it'll be great. It'll be fine. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. So another question we have is how far back do you cut the flower spikes after, after blooming on, I can't pronounce all this name, but the common name is Ruby slippers. Oh, that really tall green one that I I didn't show it in. Echeveria pulvinate arm arm. Oh, okay. Maybe? Yeah, that's a wow flower. It doesn't have flower spikes. Uh, no, wait, I'm getting it mixed up. Oh, are you talking about the Dudleyas, the Dudleya pulverolenta that had 
the flower spikes. Um, you can cut them off if you all the way to the base. Yeah, all the way to the base if you want. I I leave them. I you know uh, until they get brown and ugly, and uh, they usually just break off by themselves. But you can cut them all the way back. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and a comment we received is that Waterwise Botanicals and oh. Oasis Water Efficient Gardens have good yeah. succulent selections. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, Waterwise is great. Um, and another comment, I have a slope that goes up in my backyard. Would it be a good idea to put lots of succulent plants up there? I prefer no rocks up there though. Well, it depends on how um, how steep the slope is. I would I would actually mix, I would use more native plants because they tend to have deeper root systems than and and less succulents. I would just uh, maybe use uh, succulents uh, dotted you know here and there but they don't hold the hillside very well. They're not deeply rooted. So I wouldn't rely on that. I would rely on native plants and then, you know, put a few succulent, succulents in there. And can most succulents tolerate full sun? Well, that again, depends on where you live. If you live on the coast, absolutely yes. If you live inland, um, there's some succulents that would like a little, little bit of shade, you know, but uh, mostly I would say, yes, I would say, yes, that's true. Thank you. And we've run through our list of questions. Sharon, thank you so much for today. It was very, very interesting and beautiful. And Thank very thought-provoking. I really want to run out and start a garden now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sharon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. So...